Hello, I'm, I'm James Andrews, a uh, reporter with Food Safety News. I'm here at IFP 2014 with Dr. Martin Weedman, uh, professor of food science at Cornell University. And uh, Dr. Weedman, we've been hearing a lot this year about uh, new technology like whole genome sequencing, and I know that you've done a lot of work with that. And I'm just wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about whole genome sequencing and um, how you think it's going to revolutionize or change uh, the world of food safety and um, epidemiology. Thanks. So, f yes, that's right. This IFP genomics and whole genome sequence has taken more of a center stage. But really, we've been talking about it, doing research on it, maybe for the last five to seven years, really seriously on foodborne pathogens. But we are at a point now where you can sequence a full genome of a Listeria salmonella for about fifty dollars, and that puts it in the same realm of um, PFGE in terms of cost. Um, another challenge, even a year, two years ago, we were all worried about the bioinformatics, the analysis of these massive data sets. Can we do it? Can we do it fast enough? Those tools have developed so massively over the last couple of years that really it is feasible to sequence a full genome in five days and get significantly more information than we get from the additional PFG or the DNA fingerprinting methods and to allow us to better um, detect foodborne disease outbreaks. So where that's becoming important is some of our recent work on Salmonella enteritidis. So that's the most common Salmonella causing human disease in the US. About 50% of Salmonella enteritis have the same PFGE type, even though you might get infected from completely different sources. With full, with full genome sequencing, we can differentiate that into different subtypes and much better trace back disease outbreaks. CDC has started to do routine sequencing of Listeria, all human Listeria isolates since about last fall. It's not just the U.S. I think the same thing is happening in Ireland, same thing's happening in England, other parts of the world. So I really see full genome sequencing replacing PFG for the next five to seven years easily. The technology is moving so fast, there's so much more information we're getting and so much better information. So I think that train has really left the station and is moving very rapidly and will improve our ability to um, improve food safety detect disease outbreaks, but also prevent disease outbreaks. So it's a very interesting time. I think we just got to get used to that new language and get ready for PFG being done. <laughs> and so will there, will there be any, any reason to use PFG anymore, say, um, for uh, more rapid detection, or will whole genome sequencing even just become as rapid as PFG, or is it already there? It's, it's already there in terms of speed. I really think it's maybe time, maybe a day longer right now, but it's there. I, I was sort of, even a year ago, I would have said, you know, PFG is still going to be around because we have these huge databases, we have this historical data, but where we are right now, you could go through a freezer with 10,000 bacterial isolates and full genome sequence and probably in a, in a matter of five to six months. So I, I really, as I said, I, I was surprised even from last year to this year how Quickly, the technology has changed and improved, so I don't, th I don't think anyone's going to do P There's going to be a few little labs just because of the historical compatibility. Sure. I think industry is going to use it if they have used it because they can compare it to their old data and do long-term trending, but I think it's going to be gone pretty quickly. Okay. When we talk about whole genome sequencing, it, it kind of falls under the bigger umbrella of big data. Can you talk a bit about how... Um, how is, how is data looking to the future going to be used to improve for food safety? Yeah, so, so you're right. I mean, full genome sequencing is, to me, is only one really small part of, of the various data sets we're starting to generate at, at massively increasing speeds and, and really sort of moving real time into databases. So full genome sequencing is one. Another one we're all familiar with is um, obviously social media. The amount of data created there is huge. And, and we, we see some, I think, important changes, maybe not as much in food safety, but in, in food microbiology and the food industry. To me, social media has done for food spoilage what PulseNet has done for food safety. Um, you know, we had, used to have sort of isolated incidents of, you know, a product spoiling, having some mold on it, but I didn't know that the same product I ate, you know, my friends spoiled too. Now I snap a picture, put it on the internet, Pretty quickly, we have 20 pictures of the same product spoiling, and then companies need to react, address the issue. And, and so that's one, I think, very practical thing we've seen over the last, again, year or two years, really, companies having to respond to 
food quality concerns because of the internet. So that's one example of big data. In addition, precision agriculture. Um, we got to be realistic. The food is grown on fields. The farmers use GPS technology to better design their planting, better design their fertilization schemes. Those tools are increasingly being used for food safety. Um, we have satellites that can monitor all the fields, drones, huge area. I, I think I'm going to look two or three years in the future. I think a lot of larger produce farmers may fly drones over their fields to really monitor what's happening on those fields and use that to predict is this field safe to harvest, were there wildlife intrusions, rather than walking around the field. I think that future is, is very, very close. Um, we already see it in, in some fields. And the amount of data a drone creates when it flies over your produce field or your other fields is huge. We integrate that with satellite images, drones, genome sequence data, um, social media data, and then really make sense out of that. So the big challenge is really the data analysis part. How do you take all these data, create it into useful information that we can use to make our food safer? And I think that's where the challenge is. It's not the data collection anymore. It's really the data analysis part. And that's going to be a brave new world. We've got to train people differently. I would say, you know, my PhD students used to spend 95% of the time creating data, 5% analyzing it. Today it's more like 10% of the time creating it, 90% of the time analyzing it. And that's only going to change more. And, and I think that's the same in the industry, a lot less time spent creating the data, a lot more analyzing it. Industry needs to start using the data. There's a lot of unused data lying around which we could use to improve our food system, whether it's quality, safety, shelf life, sustainability, and that's, that's the new world. In regard to precision agriculture, do you see movement towards uh, farmers being able to use data to better safeguard against, say, well, I can grow my grow this crop a certain way over here to better safeguard against salmonella or E. coli or contamination in that way? Yeah, I think that's we've actually sort of done some work on that. Uh, and the work really is looking very good and promising that we can take maps of fields and say, you know, these are high risk areas because of the type of soil, proximity to, let's say, water, other surface features, et cetera, where there is a higher risk of, let's say, salmonella or listeria, and we can use that to predict higher risk areas where we either say, let's grow a different crop there, which might not be consumed raw or without an intervention step, or if we grow it there, we need to do more testing, we can adjust testing depending on the environment it's grown, et cetera. So I, I, I see that, that coming pretty quickly. Um, one of the challenges is that the predictors for high risk in New York are going to be different probably than the ones in California versus Arizona. So we need to spread the data in different parts of the world, in different parts of the U.S. But yeah, I think that's going to be one of the tools we have. Again, along the lines with drones and other things, we combine all of that. I think we, we have a chance of not getting the what we used to like five log reduction, but I think we can reduce our risk probably by 10 to 50 fold, I would guess, based on the data we have seen, if we use all those tools together. And that's a significant advance. Yeah. All right, well, this is exciting stuff. I, I really appreciate you talking with me. Um, looking forward to the work that you do in the next few years and what comes out of all this discussion about big data and things like that. So thank Great. you very much. Thanks. <laughs>